All right, go ahead. Hey guys, thanks all for taking the time to uh, come attend the webinar with us today. Kind of the same thing that I was talking about here is some of the uh, SNS clients. We work anywhere from large uh, broadcast facilities, post production houses, all the way down to boutique, you know, one or two man shops. Uh, we try to have a product line that's going to both enhance your workflows and make sure that you are able to get what you need done while still having a scalable solution behind you to grow as your needs may expand or change in the future. Matt, can we go ahead and move to the next slide? So what we do is we do shared storage. And what we've really coined this term as workflow-defined shared storage. And we'll get into that a little bit later as to exactly what that means and how at its core, however, it's very much how your storage server not just provides you speed in the collaboration, but also the ability to enhance and improve, streamline your workflows. We've been working with Keycode now for several years. Um, they have, a, as Matt highlighted, great engineering team that really helps not only us, but the customers as well to get all the pieces from ingest to online storage to nearline to archive and all these other bits and bobs that we need to get through our day-to-day -day life uh, and make sure they're all working seamlessly together and kind of keep them humming. But today we're here specifically to talk about Adobe Creative Cloud and how we're going to work with that, what unique challenges Adobe presents in a shared environment, and how SNS kind of helps rectify and mitigate many of those issues. And again, just keep everyone moving and working because that's really what we're here to do. We're not here to copy files and wait for them. We're here to work and get into our editorial software and go from there. So, Matt, can we go ahead and go move on to the next one? So, Keycode Media, obviously a value-added reseller. Here we highlight some of our common clients. Um, Evernote, you know, Nitro Circus is a really neat one. They do all the live uh, motocross, uh, live events there. Uh, Caviar Creative is a huge VFX and feature film production company. Uh, so we've, we've worked with some really cool clients together, and we're privileged to have done so. Uh, Matt, let's go ahead and move on. So SNS, as a company, we've been around now for 17 years, doing nothing but shared storage for video post and audio post production. Um, in that time, we've been able to work with, again, many not just great clients, but also great partners. Um, all the way from Adobe, which we're here to talk about today, the Microsoft Media Lab uses our Evo server, uh, Google, Showtime. Uh, a lot of names you know, some you may not. But let's uh, keep moving there. So I wanted to start off at, the, at a very basic level and make sure we're all coming from the same place and starting on the same page. So there's a few different ways to handle post-production or video workflows, file-based workflows you can go with local storage. And what we see here is this is where a lot of people start with the boutique production house. You've got one or two or three editors. Each one works off either their own local drive or their own direct attached drive. And that creates some workflow headaches, um, certainly not just while you're working with the local storage, but as you grow, those headaches just compound over time. So things like I have multiple copies. I have a copy of all my source material for each editor. Just making those copies and getting them out can be incredibly time consuming. And while that copy is happening and that's being disseminated to the editors, we're not working. We're waiting for a file to move, which we shouldn't have to do. The other thing we worry about is version control. Who's working on what where? What's the latest version? Because it's spread out across all these disparate drives and these disparate places. It would be kind of like having a refrigerator for each member of your family and then moving things in between them all the time. No one ever knows where the cheese is. Um, so what we do is shared storage and that's usually kind of a next step. So while people, a lot of people start with local storage, we move up to shared storage and we gain a ton of efficiencies. We have the ability to have one copy of our asset on a RAID protected server so that even if a drive fails, no data is lost. And now everyone is sharing the same file as opposed to having to have redundant multiple copies across the network that again get lost and we take up more space than we need to and things like that. Uh, in addition to that, we're going to give you the ability to do some other really cool stuff on the workflow side, which we'll get into a little bit more in the live demo here. You can see there briefly at the high end kind of our three uh, Evo lines there. We have the uh, Evo Prodigy at the top, the 1RU, the uh, 8Bay, the 2RU, and then we have a 3RU server um, at the bottom. 
then we have, and that's a kind of our flagship Evo product. We're also going to do things to help keep you organized. Um, when you move to central storage, one of the first problems you'll encounter is kind of uh, is kind of organizing and making sure we know where everything's at at any given moment. And there's a few ways that Evo is going to help you solve that as well. So moving to shared storage again just becomes much more efficient and allows us to do allows us to be a lot more flexible um, as we move on. So now let's go ahead and jump to the next slide, and we'll start to talk about how Adobe interacts with shared storage. So Adobe has obviously gained quite a bit of popularity in the last several years um, with the advent of uh, Final Cut X, <laughs> so to speak. So, But Adobe, by its nature, has some unique challenges in a workflow. First and foremost, again, the organization of assets, and that's going to be across kind of any application, but we have it built directly into our server. So we're going to allow you to index and search not just the Evo server, but any storage that's on the network. And then we're also going to allow you to apply some custom metadata uh, so you're going to be able to tag things and comment on them. And we'll show you that in the live demo here in just a little bit. The next thing we really worry about with Adobe when we go into these wide open permission systems where everyone's just in and out, back and forth, is we worry about overwriting each other's file because there's nothing built into Adobe that's going to prevent you from doing that. And so in our real world application, what can happen is two editors can actually open the same project file at the same time. Neither one of them knows the other one has it open. And at the end of the day, they're both going to save, but only one of them is actually going to save. And we're going to find out who tomorrow. So it makes for someone rather angry around the coffee machine. At SNS, we've developed kind of an, a very intuitive, very simple to use auto locking mechanism and visualization method to allow you to see who's working on what file at any time, to be able to open that file even while they're working on it, that project file, and to protect you from overwriting their file. And we'll show you exactly what that looks like in our UI again coming up here in just a second. Now up to the next kind of scale up with Adobe and what Adobe has been pioneering and is so cool for our industry is the Adobe Anywhere system. So now Adobe's kind of taking the next leap of, well, why do you all have to be in the, why do we all have to be in the same building to edit? If we're news gathering in one place, why can't we edit there? We have a sporting event, you know, in Melbourne. Why can't that work with a guy in LA to get it out and get it prepped? There's no reason other than the limitation of the LAN. And Adobe's come out with some pretty cool hardware to make to kind of optimize that speed and optimize the encoding of those streams to make sure that you're always getting the best bandwidth and able to work from anywhere in the world. Uh, it, SNS, what we've done is we've made very sure to stay compatible with that and stay as open as we can to allow that back end piece of the storage to have enough speed to dole out as many streams as you may need to across the entire globe. We can support 4K and 6K workflows. We have several clients doing that now, all the way up to 4K DPX uh, multi streaming for color grading, which becomes is becoming more and more common um, with the growth of the DaVinci Resolve system. Now let's go ahead and move to the next one. Here we see a quote from one of our clients, uh, Walter Biscardi. I don't know if any of you guys follow him on uh, Twitter or his blog. Uh, but he's been working in a multi-editor environment with Adobe and has found many, many efficiencies. He did a very nice write-up on us. I encourage you all to go look at it. Uh, and we just you can see there at the bottom, well, the editor just keeps working. So everyone's going. There's file copies going on. There's ingest happening. Um, and one of the neat things with Adobe as well is Adobe can actually support uh, growing files when coupled with the right hardware. So you can even watch your file grow on the Adobe timeline as it comes in from a transcode node or from many other uh, different applications and, pro and products. And now let's go ahead and move on to the next one now. And here what we'll do is I'm going to turn it over to Caspian Brand. Uh, he's a product specialist for the Evo. Uh, and he's also an Adobe editor, so he's super familiar with the uh, kind of the, the limitations or the issues that can come up in shared Adobe workflows. Hi, everyone. Go into that. There we go. Let's see if I can show my screen now. Steve, can you confirm you see my screen? Yep. Cool. So this is the... Uh, main interface to the share browser client software that comes with every Evo. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, many solutions uh, on the market for storage, you know, come with some sort of connection manager to manage access to the different workspaces you might have permission to see. Uh, so we've taken it a step further, as Stephen's been describing, uh, where we've included some easy asset management tools, uh, the intelligence to protect your project files. Uh, that quote from Walter uh, was he was using a another solution previous to ours, but he could only share his media. If you put his project files on there, they could be overwritten. So that's why he came to us. We added our system uh, to give him more flexibility so that you can have multiple users with all of your project files in the same location. So what that might look like, <clears throat> rather than having to have you know, 20 different versions across, you know, six different computers, we can have all of our different project versions stored centrally as well as our media. <clears throat> and then we have this visualization that shows us uh, which user has a project open. So I right now am logged in as the user edit, and I can see that uh, the user ingest is currently working on that project. So I know beforehand it's already locked by somebody else. Uh, I can choose to open it read-only, and if I do so, I would be reminded. Uh, and if I continue, I would get a read lock. <clears throat> um, and then I open this project read only. So if I tried to save, I would be prevented from overwriting the changes, but I could save a separate version to the same location as all the other projects. So it makes it a lot easier to um, keep track of everything. So if I refresh my view here, I'll see the new project. I'm now the right user for that one. Conversely, if we look at the other ingest system, I'm going to pull up the screen share here. We also see the reflection of who has which project open. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can request uh, to take over access from another user. Refresh this section. So if I want to take over, I can request an unlock. That's now going to send a message to my main system here where I see that user is requesting to take over. If I say no, then they'll get a response back saying that the request was denied. If I say yes, well then my lock is going to disappear. <coughs> And then on the other user system, we'll see that that lock is now gone and I can take over as desired. So this is very intuitive. It's easy to see and message each other. Uh, it's great for even uh, production manager or producer to at any point log in and see who's working on which project files at a time. Um, <clears throat> And uh, that works for not just Premiere projects, uh, but legacy Final Cut 7 that people are still using, um, After Effects, uh, InDesign, Illustrator. Um, we can administrate and specify uh, within the Evo interface which uh, systems. I'll show you what that looks like. <clears throat> which project files or which file types are automatically protected. So I can even include Photoshop documents, for example. So this is customizable. <clears throat> so really, Caspian, it's working with the entire Adobe suite of products. I couldn't hear you very well, Stephen. Sorry. I said, so really, this can be used with the entire Adobe suite of products. Anything Correct. Anything collaborating with anything. Yes. And even, you know, non-Adobe files. Um, it's kind of an, it's an uh, customizable automatic check-in, check-out method, if you will. Um, I can even deliberately lock files that aren't in that list just by right-clicking on them. Let's say I want to prevent somebody from changing the name of a file while I'm using it in an edit for some reason. Um, or it's a finished file that uh, is ready for QC that I want somebody to review before sending to a client. But I want to make sure that that file doesn't get changed by somebody else. <clears throat> so <clears throat> beyond the protection mechanisms, which is designed for editors and users to maintain themselves without having to call IT all the time, which may or may not exist, depending on the size of the 
installation. Um, we also have the ability to uh, tag <coughs> and search uh, across those tags. So, for example, if I do a search for train, <coughs> then I'll get search results uh, from our database uh, of these clips that have train in the uh, extra metadata that we've added. So here we can see I've had some keyword tags as well as some comments uh, describing the file. You can also play back this file if it's online. Sorry about the sound there. Um, and I can um, modify and update this information as well. So I can say um, <coughs> yeah, guard rail on the side of train. <clears throat> From these search results, I could also export uh, Final Cut 7 formatted XML, uh, which is a fairly common format, uh, which would include our tags and comments so that if I import that XML file, uh, oops, such as I've created these XML files here, um, importing those into a Premiere project, well, it brings in just the clips that I've selected specifically rather than letting the project get too large to uh, just to organize my clips. I can do that in Share Browser now. Uh, and then I'm importing just what I think I'm going to need for my edit. And the keyword tags map to the description field in Premiere when I import that XML, as well as the comments section maps to log notes. So all of this metadata that we've uh, added to our clips um, in Share Browser can be brought into the NLE. So we can save time on, you know, even bringing in, uh, you know, not using Adobe licenses just to um, add media organization for your clips before they go into a project. Um, so you don't have to tie up uh, Edit Machine you know, just to do some of this uh, basic information. <clears throat> um, in addition to, uh, so Stephen mentioned earlier that uh, we can index not just Evo storage, but uh, storage that's not Evo. So here within the administrator application, um, <clears throat> I see records of drives across different systems, even locally attached drives. So this drive is a USB 3 drive connected to a Mac Mini. Um, that I'm not logged into, right? So we can index existing storage as well as what's on your Evo so you can keep track of um, and repurpose uh, existing storage for new line backups. I mean, oftentimes when you're getting new shared storage, it was residing somewhere else already. So we can keep track of where it came from before you logged into, um, <clears throat> or before you added it to Share Browser. So if I take a look, for example, on this Mac Mini, and I see I have some local drives here. <clears throat> Here's a USB 3 drive I have connected. And if I copy, say, this, um, <clears throat> I'm going to mount a new workspace. And then if I copy this from here to there, it's going to be indexed. Oh, that's too large. I didn't check. I didn't grab the right one. Um, <clears throat> it'll index before um, it'll index the file before it copies it. So this is the right one. So it's indexing both the original location and the shared location uh, as it copies these files over. So if I'm looking on this other machine, I can see a record of these other drives that have been indexed as well. So any of my search results can help show me, you know, which backup drive to pull off the shelf if I need to restore a project to uh, the Evo, for example. 
right? So it becomes a very um, easy tool to use uh, in terms of indexing and uh, searching all of your assets, um, as well as performing some uh, backup tasks. So we can also do uh, data verification when we copy files. So if I copy this file, I can do a paste and a verify, and I'll let the computer do a bit for bit you know, verification and make sure that the file contents are not different from the source and the target. Those verifications we can also keep a log of So we can use that as a list if a client gives us an external drive. Uh, we can, you know, grab that log of both successful and failed files to report back. Hey, I got everything. Everything was cool. Or hey, these three files, no matter what, you know, how I transfer them, keep coming back with errors. You might want to double check your source uh, as well. So um, other verification tools that we include are checksums. So if you're delivering a file via your cloud services or whatever to external clients, um, you can also provide a sidecar file of an MD5 checksum. The more routes and hops you send files through the network with, uh, the more likely there is to be minor corruption on the other end. So uh, providing an MD5 for people to verify against can help save time in chasing down uh, weird anomalies with files that may have uh, occurred when traversing the internet. Hey guys, this is not to interrupt you, Casping, but this is really important because more and more networks are going to the requirement of having an MD5 log associated with a deliverable. Uh, Discovery Networks is probably the most famous for it. They want it on an LTO tape and they want it with an LT with a MD5 checksum verification so that they can verify the file when they receive it that it is in its original form. So this is going to allow you to have everything at your fingertips and do it from one interface without having to bounce to multiple windows and things like that. Really what we've done with the share browser here is given you a unified interface to manage not only all your network shares, your local drives in one window. So we're not just mounting stuff up onto a desktop and having to open many finder windows or explorer windows or anything like that. And then Caspian 2, there's a lot of great protection here that you're telling me about as far as overwriting and things like that, seeing what's on the backup drive so I know where to grab it. What happens if somebody just accidentally deletes something? So we also, for our network shares, in terms of, uh, you know, beyond just uh, protecting the files, we have a network recycle bin. Uh, some, some network solutions out there don't have, a, have any network recycle bin at all or don't do an excellent job of maintaining that. So uh, if there is no recycle bin, if somebody accidentally deletes something, this does happen. Even the best of us uh, sometimes have a computer that decides to act slow for whatever reason, running too many apps, taxing the RAM, and you think you're clicking on one thing, but by the time you release, it clicked on the wrong button, like delete. Well, if there's no recycle bin, then the file's instantly gone. So we've added a network recycle bin, so if I delete this file for some reason, um, first I'm reminded, do I really want to do that? Uh, and then um, <clears throat> the administrator of the system has the ability to browse the recycle bin so we can look for deleted files. So I can see that, oh, hey, this file was deleted. I didn't mean to do that. Let's restore the selected item. So now if we come back, refresh, the file is back. Uh, so the administrator can choose to you know, manually do that as part of their daily tasks, or they can define an automatic purge and tell the Evo to automatically empty the recycle bin at X intervals, like once a day or once a week or once a month or whatever. So there's some good safety checks in there as well. Stephen, am I missing anything? 
No, I think that's uh, that's most of it. I would like to bring up the cloud integration because, guys, again, we want you to have one interface to deal with everything you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So we've even given you the ability to expose these cloud services, and we're always adding more right inside of the share browser interface. So you can navigate to everything quickly, move between different workspaces for different tasks, all from one central window, one pane of glass. And so yeah, enabling really this. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Enabling this feature uh, exposes that folder to appear like a workspace along with all of your other uh, volumes that you are using on a daily basis. So it gives it higher visibility. So yeah, the idea here really was to get you into the share browser and into your production application. And that's it. So you're not dealing with six finder windows or explorer windows or anything like that. And it's all right there, self-contained. And the neat, really cool thing with our software at the end of the day is it's free. When you scale up, if you add users, we give you more seats of software just because you have our server. So we're not going to come after you for multiple per seat license fees. We're not going to ask you to renew those license fees every year. We're not going to turn off your software. And so here we have that kind of high-level view of the share browser, as Caspian was describing. So we've really, again, just tried to streamline the workflow and make sure everybody has all the tools that they need at any given moment and give you the flexibility in your workflows to adjust on the fly. Our, our industry is constantly changing. Our projects are constantly changing. Uh, all of our workspaces there that you saw in, the, in Caspian's demo are dynamically resizable up or down. Uh, so you can grow them, you can shrink them as the need dictates. The other cool thing we're going to do is we like to keep the network as simple as possible. So, and it's, sometimes that's easier to do than others. It depends on how many users. But we're going to give you a really high port density on the back of the server. With our largest Evo there at the bottom, the 16 bay, you can direct connect up to 28 clients. Or you could have 12 10 gig clients connected, or even 12 fiber channel clients, and mix and match between them. Evo also has what's called a fiber to iSCSI bridge because, again, we want you to be able to use legacy storage. And eight years ago, we had to have fiber channel just to stream HD content. We couldn't really do it over Ethernet. It wasn't fast enough. So there are people out there with legacy fiber drives and fiber channel infrastructure. We're going to allow you to actually repurpose that, plug the fiber channel into the Evo, bridge those fiber channel volumes or targets out over what's called iSCSI um, over the Ethernet network. And that way, everyone has access to everything, regardless of how they're connected. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed this. And uh, hopefully we've taught you something or learned something, maybe you know something new or something to, something to worry about or a way to solve something you're already worried about. Uh, you can contact either KeyCode or SNS to get more information about this. KeyCode is excellent at deploying these and helping design them. Uh, feel free to hit us up as well. Certainly check out the website, and feel free to, if you have to show this to anybody else who wasn't able to make it today, I think we'll be posting it to YouTube later this afternoon uh, or tomorrow, and you'll be able to then use that and flow around.